I really think I'm entitled to an answer to that question. No, I see everything upside down. How nice! You ever get that sinking feeling? You know, the one that you feel you've only heard maybe half the story? Or even a different story altogether? Hello and welcome to the Red Pill Diary. I'm Lewis, and I'll be your host. So, ready or not, let's flip the switch and shed some light on it. Hugely expensive and lucrative yeah, for a few, the effort was fraught with difficulty, scandals, villainy, fraud, and tragedy on both sides. The Great Race, as it was called, proceeded regardless of the physical obstacles. It brought the two companies within four miles of each other. A crowd of well-wishers witnessed the historical event and enjoyed the carnival-like atmosphere. It was a parched day in May as the crews worked in tandem foot by foot, cheered on by the crowds filled with the bright banners and buggies and elaborate carriages, including the spectrum of society, influential and the ordinary, to view the two competitors and their drive to meet precisely at the same point on the arid Utah soil. They chose a site not for previous historical relevance, but for practicality. They wanted to get paid. And the then current president indicated that that wouldn't happen unless they did meet at the exact same spot. The debate was over. The two met, and at precisely 12.47 p.m., the sledgehammer drove the final spike into the last bit of track that linked the two railroads to form the Transcontinental Railroad. Some would assert that it's marked the beginning of the American Industrial Revolution. It was May 10th, 1869. So let's set the stage. Before I go into the background of what's going on, I think we need two bookends, things, quotes that were written about a century apart. As I finish reading them, you'll, I think you'll get the idea of why these are important for the first four episodes and for all episodes going forward to keep this in mind. The first one was written in 1788. It's from James Madison, wasn't president at the time. He will be president after Jefferson. It's Federalist number 51. Ambition must be made to counteract ambition. The interests of a man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. It may be a reflection on human nature that such devices should be necessary to control the abuses of government. But what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. Now, this was written in Federal 51 on the topic of the structure of government and checks and balances. So you can see with that theme, that's where Madison is going with that. Fast forward 100 years in 1887, Lord Acton, and you'll know when I read this quote why I chose him. This is written as a letter to Bishop Crichton. He was formerly a Cambridge history professor. He subsequently became the Bishop of London. Uh, Lord Acton also was a Cambridge history professor. And when I read the quote, you'll know why this is famous. Historic responsibility has to make up for the want of of legal responsibility. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's the quote everybody knows. But he also goes on and says in this letter, great men are almost always bad men, even when they exercise influence and not authority, still more when you super add the tendency or the certainty of corruption by authority. Now, let's go back to 1790 before we go forward in today's episode. It's September 1787, we're in Philadelphia. It's the Constitutional Convention. This Constitutional Convention was held in secret. Apparently, they had an agreement. Whatever was said in there was going to stay in there until everyone had passed. Once all the participants passed, the information would be released. Well, it started to leak out about 1820s. Robert Yates, it was an American politician. He died in 1801, and his widow in 1820 allowed his notes that he took during the convention to be published. He was, a, he was known as a founding father. He was also best known as the leader of the Anti-Federalist Movement. Remember a couple of episodes we talked about Federalist, Anti-Federalist. Well, he was an Anti-Federalist. He wrote essays under the pseudonym of Brutus and Sidney. The reason that's important is because Adams, Hamilton, and Jay, and even Madison, wrote for the Federalists under pseudonyms to encourage the delegates to ratify the Constitution. Here you have the Anti-Federalists, Brutus, Sidney, and others who are actually opposed to the Constitution based on the scope of the national government and the diminished sovereignty of the states. This dialogue is going back and forth between these two parties, Anti-Federalists and Federalists, about the Constitution. But the people didn't get at the time what actually was said 
at the Constitutional Convention until 1820s, 1823. Another person contemporaneous with that was a politician. His name was John Taylor. He would be known as John Taylor of Caroline. Uh, he wrote another book called The New Views of the Constitution of the United States, and he relied heavily on Robert Yates's notes. And it was published in 1823, I believe. Now, I can hear you saying, what's this mean? What, what's all this names and places and dates? Well, this all goes back to Hamilton, at least in the beginning, because what these books reveal is how quickly Alexander Hamilton moved to consolidate political power in the hands of a centralized government, in the hands of executive branch, essentially. And he, at the convention, had proposed, secretly, because it wasn't disclosed till later, a permanent president and the Senate. He wanted all political power in the national government, and he wanted it as far away from the people as possible and centered in the executive. He basically wanted a lifetime executive. That's not what he's arguing in The Federalist. But what happens? As soon as they ratify the Constitution, Hamilton flips the script and starts to work exactly for what he argued for using the wording of the Constitution and his Federalist friends, Chief Justice Marshall and others, to circumvent the actual language of the Constitution. Now, does that sound familiar? Where have we seen that just recently? Well, I can give you one suggestion. Think about what just occurred with the student loan forgiveness. What did the Supreme Court of the United States say you couldn't do? And what actually started to happen? So you can see this, this influence. Take these two instances. What did Hamilton say and start to do? And what do you see being done? So this is, this is not new. It's, it's happened before. Well, why does it keep happening? Well, because there was no consequences for it happening. Now, remember what Madison had said in Federalist Number 51? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. And if angels were to govern men, neither external or internal controls on government would be necessary. What's really striking is that government itself is but a reflection on human nature. Think about what Alexander Hamilton stated and what his behavior indicated. Because, as Lord Acton had said, sometimes legal responsibility doesn't happen. And in this case, things keep happening because there's no legal responsibility. He's saying that historic responsibility has to make up for that, meaning there has to be a judgment about individuals and their roles in history. Because power tends to corrupt, but ever since the beginning, that's why we went back to Alexander Hamilton, since the beginning, people have been trying to negate the checks and balances. And why are people always trying to get around it? They're trying to get around it because they want the power. And that power, once given to them, corrupts. And once someone gets into position of absolute power, a dictator, a faction, even the majority becomes absolute. And we're going to see that because we're getting ready to go forward to 1760. And we're going to see what absolute power can do to people and groups where there is no legal responsibility and no real moral accountability. Exactly the reason Madison argued the need for checks and balances, the one thing that everybody tries to get around. So we fast forwarded to July 2nd, 1862. Now this is right in the middle of the second year of the Civil War. President Lincoln was president. He signed the Pacific Railway Act. Congress actually granted a charter to the Union Pacific Railroad Company permitting this company to build a railroad from Omaha, Nebraska. President Lincoln, who had the obligation or the privilege to pick the starting point in the original bill, actually chose Council Bluff. Uh, it was changed by the vice president of the company, who was a railroad executive. Lincoln was familiar with railroads. He had worked as an attorney for several of the railroads. And apparently the choice of Council Bluff was because Lincoln owned some real estate holdings in Council Bluff, Iowa. My question then is, does this remind you of something that occurred in 1790, the Compromise of 1790, and the changing of the capital to Washington, D.C.? What was that next to? President Washington State. Council Bluff, Iowa, President Lincoln owned real estate holdings there. Not saying, just thinking. So the president initially of the Union Pacific at that time was a Major General Dix, who happened to be active in the military during this period of time because the Civil War was ongoing. So you essentially have a chartered company that's not really doing much. It's kind of dormant, and it doesn't get started right away. But let me tell you some of the things that were in the bill just in generally. The government promised to 
to give the railroad or pay $16,000 a mile for track laid on level ground. Today, that's about 500 grand a mile. On the foothills, 32,000 a mile, or about $1 million per mile in today's money. In the mountains, it was 48,000 per mile, or about $1.5 million per mile in today's money. The government also granted 6,400 acres of government-owned land for every 10 miles of track laid. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. And here's why you want oversight when money is available. Enter the picture, Thomas Durant, a medical doctor who turned businessman. He gained control of the Union Pacific Railroad by buying over $2 million in shares. Now, think of that. $2 million in 1864. And he did basically, with that kind of money, he installed his own man as president. During this period of time, the company called Credit Mobilier of America, and it was basically a business front that appeared to be an independent contractor. So you can see where this is going. He had this independent contractor, a straw business, to construct the railroad. However, the Credit Mobilier was owned by Union Pacific investors. It's basically interlocked between these two. Remember, this is going to happen again. So we're starting here with a railroad, with a railroad tycoon, and you're going to see these interlocking boards. Fast forward 60 years from now, we're going to touch on that when you see this really get ramped up. But in the beginning right now, here's the first, one of the first instances I could find where you've got this interlocking board. Well, in this case, you've got the Civil War going on. People are distracted. The president's busy. People aren't overseeing what's going on because they're focused on this war for obvious reasons. But when someone else is looking somewhere else, opportunity avails itself. And this won't be the first time this type of thing has happened. Okay, so they create this company and their next few years, it basically starts to charge excessive fees for the work that's being done. And because they're, they're being paid by the, the mile, Durant, he, he basically changes the route to lengthen it so that he can ad take in additional money. He cloak those in, well, here's your thousand shares. And when the dividends come in, that'll pay for it. The dividends and the payouts were enormous. You've got the fox looking over the hen house is what you have. When you th think back now about what Madison said in uh, Federalist 51, this is a mirror of human nature. This is what's going on. Let's stop a minute. Think currently, because that's what we're dealing with here. Think currently. Does this mirror something else we see? Think about Congress people who go into Congress now. They go in there with a net worth of zero. Within six years, they've got a net worth of $29 million on a salary of 175000 Granted, you could then not pay anything because you're getting everything done for you. But still, how many people you know who can make $175,000 a year and turn it into $29 million just by working the stock market like an average person. <laughs> now, either you're really good at trading or you're really good at doing something, but the opportunity was presented because you're in Congress. This happens over and over again. And when we go back to 1790, guess what Alexander Hamilton offered the people that were in Congress then? And even before that, what did they offer them? Land grants, speculating on land. Knox and Dewar, what happened? They took money that were supposed to go to the, the war and they used it to speculate in land. The people that are going in there, if they're not being monitored, that's going to be a reflection of what human nature is. That is why they have checks and balances. This is why they try to get around it. So what's the reason you think senators and Congress people who happen to chair committees why do you think they would be giving gifts to them? Would it be because they wanted them to help them make decisions or pave the way? Sort of like a quid pro quo for doing me a favor. Yep, that's likely what happened. So let's get back to our story. So in September of 1872, a man named McComb publishes in the New York Sun the names of the members of Congress who are gifted credit mobile or stock. So we have the Illegal manipulation of contracts by a construction and a finance company associated with building the Union Pacific Railroad. This scandal is a symbol of post-Civil War corruption, one of the bigger problems of um, Grant's administration. You know, even though the, the way this is conducted is kind of typical of 19th century railroad building and business in general, these individuals the veteran railroad people knew that more money can be made from construction contracts than operating the railroad. We're going to see this happen again. 
the whole thing setup was a bunch of complex arrangements whereby a few men basically contracted with themselves to as assignees for the construction, but they destroyed their railroad in the process. It will impoverished it anyway. When it was revealed that this congressman, his name is Oaks Ames, he was from Massachusetts, they investigated and they censured him. But him and another colleague, several others, included, you know, a vice president, Colfax, they absolved them despite the fact they were involved or at least tangentially involved. And they're not the only ones. You know, when I was in law school, there was this phrase that the criminal professor, law professor would say, pigs get fatter, hogs get slaughtered. So don't be a hog. That's the problem. Somebody got mad because they couldn't get more. And what did they do? He basically said, either give me the stock or I'm going to publish the, the names. They didn't believe him. Guess what? He published the names. And when that hit the paper, an investigation ensued. The only problem is the fox is investigating himself. And what do you think is going to happen when the fox investigates itself? One thing I noticed in all of this, when I was going through this and reading about this and learning about this, trying to just cement this in my head, is that of all this money that was made, I can't find any instance where anybody had to pay it back. Here's taxpayer money, or at least one would argue the money that's coming from tariffs or the labor of the people that live in the country to build something for the benefit of the country. I mean, we're talking today's dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars to a few people who happen to be in charge in Congress. Now, I want to go back again to what James Madison said. Government is a mirror of the human condition. That's my phrase. So what do we see? We see people, this corrupt scandal, and we see scandals over and over again because that is the condition. That's the human condition. And we're expecting people to act differently. And we need to make sure that those checks and balances are in place. And you say, well, okay, that's great. But how do we do that? By paying attention, looking at history, putting it up and saying, wait, wait a minute here. This is happening again. Look at the money that's being thrown. Look at the money they're printing. Look at the money they're doling out to all these different types of companies. And who do you think benefits from it? Those contractors. Guess what's going to happen when we get down here and start looking at some of this? You're going to find there's a lot more people connected that are married to each other, that are related to each other, that, that have been in politics for their entire life, and they're millionaires, tenfold or a hundredfold. Where do you think they're getting that money? I'm not saying everybody is doing anything. I'm just saying if I use history as a guide, then I have a pattern to say, well, wait a minute here. Could it possibly be that that person who has really no visibility gives a testimony before Congress and all of a sudden this person gets a book deal for $8 million and no books get sold? What's that tell you? Well, at least it should raise questions for you. And we're going to go back to wherever that takes us or wherever it takes me. But if our government is a mirror of the human condition, what is our government reflecting today? I'll leave the lights on for you. Well, we filled those pages. If you have comments, suggestions, share them. You know, the more input, the more likely a better outcome. I'm moving forward because backwards is not an option. I've turned the lights on here and I'll be leaving it that way. Join me next time on The Red Pill Diary.